But these things I have told you, that when the hour shall come, you may remember that I told you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Feast of Our Savior's Ascension, the octave of which we are currently celebrating, is a reminder to us that, as our blessed Lord declares to Pilate, his kingdom is not of this world. It is a reminder to us that our purpose for being on this earth is not to amass as large an amount of money or other material possessions as possible, or to enjoy the maximal degree of sensual gratification that might be pursued, or to revel in lording it over our fellow men and forcing them to bend in subservience to our will. We are on this earth to know, to love, and to serve God, so that we might be happy with him forever in heaven. Whither Christ ascends, in order, as he himself declares, to prepare a place for us, and to send us the paraclete, the comforter, Christ likewise ascends into heaven in order to take possession of his kingdom and to reign gloriously for all eternity. We, who have pledged our fidelity to our divine king on the day of our baptisms, must keep this fidelity by means of a lively faith, a firm hope, and an ardent charity. Ours must be a lively faith, for, as the Apostle declares, without faith it is impossible to please God. The virtue of faith causes us to give the assent of our intellect to accept as the truth all that God has revealed and which the Holy Catholic Church proposes to our belief. For God is the author of all truth, and God can neither deceive nor be deceived. Reject so much as a single article of faith, or even consider it to be potentially false, and you have already lost the virtue of faith. For if it were possible that God should deceive even once, then faith is meaningless. He who is not with me is against me, our Savior declares. And thus it is that the virtue of faith requires not only that we should believe all that God has revealed, but also that we should likewise reject as false all those things which are opposed to faith. We are here today because the virtue of faith demands that we reject as antipopes those who are imposing false doctrines and evil disciplines upon the church. The virtue of faith likewise demands that we should repudiate attendance at masses of those who, like the SSPX, the Society of St. Pius X, who pollute the holy sacrifice by offering it in union with the false hierarchy of Vatican II. The Mass and the sacraments pertain to the unity of faith, to the very definition of what makes us a Catholic. To partake of them is to declare unity of belief. To attend the masses and to partake of the sacraments of those who are in union with the Vatican II hierarchy is to declare that you share the same faith as do they. That Jorge Bergoglio is the vicar of Christ on earth, of whom our Savior declares, he that heareth you heareth me. It is to partake 
in a gross lie contrary to faith. Not only must we have the virtue of faith, but ours must also be a lively faith. It is not sufficient merely to accept that the Catholic faith is true and divinely revealed. We must conform our lives in accordance with our belief, doing all that God commands and avoiding all that God forbids. Faith without works, as St. James says, is dead. We must have a firm hope, confidently expecting that God will keep his promise. After all, he cannot deceive. And that therefore, through the merits of Christ, will grant us the eternal happiness of heaven as a reward for our fidelity. Since God has promised us heaven, likewise has he bound himself to provide to us all that is necessary for us to reach it. In the practical order, the forgiveness of our sins and the assistance of his grace. Thus it is that the virtue of hope avoids both presumption and despair. For on the one hand, we recognize that it is the grace of God which enables us to reach heaven. And on the other, we admit that forgiveness is promised to all those who sincerely repent. We must have an ardent charity, for our Savior commands us to love God with our whole heart and with our whole soul and with our whole mind and with all our strength. So great must be our charity that we are willing to endure any hardship, any persecution, rather than to violate the laws of God. Our blessed Lord warns us in today's gospel that his disciples will be made the outcasts of society, and even that the time will come that the world considers it a service to God to put them to death. We ourselves have not been asked to become martyrs, to shed our life's blood in testimony of our love for God. But we are still bound to so detest even a single mortal sin that we would rather die than so grievously to offend God. If you love me, our Savior commands, keep my commandments. Perhaps today finds us not unlike the apostles after the ascension, weak, timid, worldly-minded. Our blessed Lord, before ascending into heaven, promised them the paraclete, the comforter, who was to teach them all truth. We see the effect that the coming of the Holy Ghost has upon them at Pentecost. They are entirely transformed into zealous and courageous apostles who boldly preach the faith to the four corners of the world, remaining faithful to their divine master, even to the shedding of their life's blood. In these days leading up to the great feast of Pentecost, let us also pass the time, as the apostles themselves did before the first Pentecost, in prayer with our Heavenly Mother, so that we too might receive of the Holy Ghost the burning flame of charity symbolized by the tongues of fire, and with it the fullness of his sevenfold gifts, 
so that we might remain faithful to our divine King throughout life and be able to receive the place in heaven that has been prepared for us. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.